Welcome. This is uh, Joe Holbrook with Cloud Burst Corp, based out of Jacksonville, Florida. Looking forward to spending uh, the next uh, hour or so with y'all. Let's go ahead and get started. So we'll be talking about the CompTIA Cybersecurity Analyst Certification. This is a fairly new one. Only it's only been out since about February, so. Not a lot of people have uh, have taken this yet, and uh, it is uh, part of the CompTIA security uh, knowledge framework. So we'll go ahead and um, talk more about this. So I'm uh, Joe, Joe Holbrook, as as uh, as you know, um, owner of Cloud Burst and Corp here in Jacksonville, Florida. I've been a cloud consulting architect and technical trainer for, for quite a while. I've been uh, focused mainly around cloud computing, uh, cloud security, IT data security, uh, and storage. I've had the opportunity to work for uh, uh, great companies, great vendors and bars for, for quite a while, um, and uh, d definitely got the chance to, to do uh, some some great uh, implementations and and be involved in some great sales as well. Been also a government contractor on and off for 10 years. Also a DoD 8570 qualified. Um, and uh, as far as uh, my focus around security has been mainly cryptography. Um, uh, one of my uh, uh, prior gigs was mainly focused around brocade encryption, RSA, uh, etc. Also, uh, a CompTIA subject matter expert. I had the opportunity to work on uh, the Cloud Plus Cloud Essentials exam. So I know a little bit about how CompTIA um, works uh, with their exam development, and uh, I will say they do an amazing job of test development. Um, as a trainer, I can tell you not every organization invests the time and effort that CompTIA does in their testing. I, I, I can, can say that. And I've, uh, I've certainly um, worked on other tests for other vendors uh, in the past. So what are we going to cover today? Let's go ahead and understand what you're going to be tested on. Now. Before we talk about that, let's go ahead and give you an idea of what we're going to cover in this, uh, what will likely be about an hour, uh, at plus or minus 15 minutes. I'm going to do my best to give you as much information as I can as quickly as possible. Now, if I was going to teach the full course, this would be a five-day event. This is a 40-hour course where we will cover all the frameworks, all the tool sets, all the best practices, all the vulnerabilities. Um, again, um, can only do so much in an hour and a half. What I will likely do, follow up with another one of these uh, videos. Uh, depending on how well uh, this turns out, I may or may not do it. We shall see. But in the meantime, let's get rolling. So we're going to talk about what is the CompTIA CSA. What are the roles? Talk about the exam objectives, the exam format. We're going to talk about the frameworks. We're going to talk about tool sets. And then as a bonus, I threw in there the security appliances um, uh, area that we would actually uh, module, essentially, that we would cover. It's the shortest one, but a, a very important one I wanted to get in. Um, and then we'll talk about DOD 8570 uh, and uh, what's going on with that for those folks, especially in government contracting or in the military or government uh, uh, employees. And then I also threw in some mock questions to test your knowledge, see how you all, uh, you know, uh, do on them. Feel free. So what is the CompTIA CSA? Well, the CompTIA CSA is the Cybersecurity Analyst Exam. Now, one thing I want to clarify, because I always get questions on this, is what does the plus sign mean? Well, the plus sign means 
is that there is continuing ed required. So this cert is usually uh, three years, and then there's going to be um, essentially um, additional um, continuing ed required to maintain the cert. So this is designed for security analysts, vulnerability analysts, and threat intelligent analysts. So the exam will, um, again, test your knowledge, how to configure these tools, perform analysis, and then uh, interpret re results to essentially protect your organization, essentially. I'm not going to read it all, of course. Feel free to do that yourself. Now, what are the duties typically for a CSA? Now, again, every company is going to have their own take on it. Um, but again, generally, this could be a junior or senior level, could report up to the CISO. Uh, then, you know, again, your job function could be around implementing, configuring controls. You'll be using the tool sets, of course, um, likely like Snort, Mapper, etc., to help help you protect your enterprise. Uh, you may be on a response team, so like a blue, a red, etc. And uh, we'll talk briefly about that as well. We'll talk about auditing. We'll talk about delivering training uh, as well. And then also too, performing risk assessments. And then maintaining an up-to-date threat intelligence. So what are the objectives? So the objectives uh, of this uh, uh, of this exam is going to essentially make sure you can identify the tools and techniques to basically um, monitor your network or security system. You'll also be collecting, analyzing, and interpreting data. So basically, you'll need to use tool sets um, like Splunk, for example. Possibly, you don't need to use that, but they want you on the test to identify different tool sets um, to, to be able to, to do this objective. Network host and web application vulnerability. We'll talk about how to mitigate that. We'll talk about identity management authentication access control issues. So basically we'll talk about everything from ACLs to permissions to um, IAM, intrusion detection, you name it. <coughs> Excuse me. We'll talk about being on a response team. And then lastly, we'll, we'll, we'll of course be talking about um, frameworks actually first, uh, but if you took the, the course, it would be one of the last things we talk about. Um, I'm covering frameworks specifically in tool sets because this is the two areas that I typically um, see uh, clients and consultants not really grasp as well. And so if there's an area of the test, this would probably be the area that will um, challenge you. Now, what about the exam format. Now you'll see that the format is actually very very simple. It's only four areas, four domains. Now threat management, this is basically how you would manage threats, mitigate threats to your environment like who's coming in, ports that are open, um, you know, determining who's doing what, look, you know, dealing with, uh, you know, SQL injection, DDoS, etc. Vulnerability management, this could be anything from zero day issues to uh, dealing with, uh, uh, you know, network ports being open, you name it. Cyber incidents, this is basically how do you respond to an incident? Who are you going to call? What are you going to do? How do you contain the situation? Security architecture, we'll talk about the tool sets out there and, and of course, uh, the frameworks. Okay, so uh, another thing that I like to just briefly touch on is a lot of folks are not sure of where the cert fits in. And CompTIA 
has done a great job at really identifying where the CSA fits in into their career path. So this cert is considered basically an experienced certification. In other words, you're going to have solid experience in the IT industry generally before you take this. Now, again, that doesn't mean you can't pass a test without, you know, um, a lot of experience. But again, that's, you know, your call to, to judge. So um, CASP is still considered the top tier cert. This is CASP is similar to CISSP. Now, as far as the topics, uh, this is basically the topics that were, and it looks like I spelled reconnaissance wrong. Sorry about that. Uh, as far as um, the topics, cybersecurity analysts. So we'll talk about what an, an analyst does. We'll talk about how do you monitor what's going on? How do you identify issues? We'll talk about security appliances like uh, firewalls, uh, for example, network monitors talk about logging. We'll talk about products like uh, Splunk, uh, possibly. Vulnerability, we'll tie, you know, again, that goes without saying. Secures, now this is an area that's new. You don't typically see this in other security certs. This is a, a newer a topic, uh, at least from what I've seen. I, I think it's great because someone with a uh, well-diverse developer background um, working with developers, um, I can assure you that one of the best things you could do is to identify possible vulnerabilities and, and mitigate them before you roll out software. Incident response. Now, how do you handle? Who are you going to call, right? What about forensics tools? How do you how do you lock down a system? How do you keep data secure so that the authorities can come and, and handle it for you? Incident analysis and recovery. A secured network design, another area that, again, it's better to build the network. Identifying issues and vulnerabilities and then just building it uh, without thinking of that. Managing identities, and then we'll talk about the frameworks like NIST. So again, this is the, all these topics. This is a five-day class. We're not going to get to all these. Um, the main goal is to to talk about at least uh, briefly uh, two or three of these, so that you have an idea. And I'm covering areas that mainly people miss. These are the areas that almost everyone, without like a lot of hands-on or federal government experience. Uh, may not get correct. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about the test itself. This is brand new, February 15, 2017, only a few months. Not too many people know this exam. Uh, in other words, it's, it's still in its infancy. This is a very solid exam, very well written in my opinion. Um, kudos to CompTIA and the SME team that uh, worked on this. It is multiple choice and performance based. It's around 85 questions. Another question I get is, well, why does it say maximum? Why can't they say, you know, 80 or 85 or 90, whatever? Well, CompTIA, just like a lot of other um, vendors and test uh, proctoring uh, uh, development, uh, actually the term I'm trying to use is uh, uh, content developers, etc like to test out questions so you may get some beta questions in there just to see um, you know the response the, some of them you don't get tested on typically so again and then also too the test is performance based so um, I've not totally gotten a good answer as to if you if you get everything right do they give you 80 questions is that 85 that that's sort of considered a, a secret I guess um, for the privileged few, so I don't know what the correct answer would be there, but I'm guessing um, that that's probably uh, what similar to what Microsoft was doing. Now you get 165 minutes. This is a long time, so again, 165 minutes, 60 minutes to an hour. Do the math. That's that's pretty good. 
passing score 750. Now, CompTIA does their scaling a little different. A lot of people that take tests are used to, you know, a skill of 0 to 100. CompTIA uses 100 to 900. Now, the biggest challenge of all for some folks is the cost. I'll, I'll be honest. Uh, there's no question that the CompTIA certs are more expensive than a fair number of certs, and especially like the certs that are entry level, um, you know, still paying $200, 300 for um, some certs could be a barrier to a lot of people. So, um, again, um, I'm not knowledgeable in the business aspect of test development, so I leave that to the experts, of course, to answer. Okay, so let's start off by talking about frameworks. Now, one of the areas on the test is going to be around frameworks. Now, again, frameworks are not exciting. I'm not going to pretend I get excited by them. I think they're, you know, I think they're necessary, but again, a lot of people get pretty bored by frameworks. So I'm going to try to make this as exciting as possible. Now, frameworks are very important because without a framework, right, um, you're not going to really have an idea of how something should be developed or put together or how best practices should be identified. But anyway, so one of the areas that you really need to know is NIST. And I'm going to go over to my browser here and I want to show you uh, some resources. I'm going to go to NIST first. Now, on the NIST website, uh, NIST has uh, the Computer Security Division. This is the these are the go-to folks around the framework for a lot of the federal government frameworks, directives. They also work together with Congress to write um, a lot of the, um, um, you know, laws and, and uh, you know, other acts that, you know, basically it would be called an act. But, uh, again, you know, they're a quasi-governmental uh, organization they're actually under the Department of Commerce so but one of the areas you want to know is understand FISMA so FISMA is the Federal Information Security Management Act now there's a, a few PDFs I'm going to show you some of them but for time purposes I'm not going to walk you through all of them FISMA so take a look at FISMA know what FISMA is Understand uh, areas like this, for example, around FISMA. Understand RMF, and, and again, take a little time uh, to do that. If you take the class, we're going to walk you through all this. And then the GoDaddy of them all is going to be the NIST Special Pub 853A. And I'm going to go ahead and bring up my PDF here. Now, this is the PDF. You'll see that this is the NIST SP 853A. Um, R4 or etc. I can't read that. It's a little tough for me to see. But to go over here um, to the table of contents, what I'd like you to do is to go through this document. It's it's uh, it's fairly lengthy. It's 462, but I'm going to identify some areas I think um, that you want to focus on. And the first area is going to be really focused uh, around fundamentals. So you want to really understand risk management. So take a look at risk management. Look at uh, uh, the uh, RMF steps. Uh, and this is, again, uh, a framework here you want to take a look at. Understand the structures and, and just go through um, at a high level these areas. What, what I'd like you to, to really focus on, uh, and let me go back to as well another area, is going to be around um, assurance and trustworthiness. So, for example, um, read uh, anything that is uh, basically in like gray. These are you know areas that you may see. Uh, a lot of this is going to be in the content for the course. But if you don't take the course, I would highly recommend you focus on the gray boxes. Another area too is read about um, assurance evidence, for example, and understand like the strength of security. And then assurance, understand what assurance means to the organization, 
again, look at the trustworthy model, understand that trustworthiness has essentially um, these areas that you want to um, refine or memorize, I mean. And again, for time purposes, I don't really have a lot of time to um, go through the PDF. It's fairly lengthy. But you'll get a good idea by reading um, some of these areas. So this is the PDF link here. And then uh, I also encourage you, again, this is, uh, this is the RMF framework, another area that we would cover. Now, with the framework, there's different steps. So this is called the risk-based approach. Highly recommend you take a look at this. There's also some cool slides over here um, you could download. Um, this is actually, um, you know, oddly enough, uh, the course uh, actually takes some of this and <laughs> um, sort of... Uh, puts it into the course. So I would recommend you sort of look at this one. So again, uh, with that said, um, a lot of reference to NIST. So I hope you get the point. Okay. FIPS. Another area would be FIPS. Understand what FIPS is. That's the Federal Information uh, Processing um, uh, System and, and do understand what FIPS means. And then this is FISMA as well. Okay, so those are the those are the you know main frameworks I want you to take a look at. Now another one I didn't cover um, is also going to be FedRAMP. I, I do recommend FedRAMP. Um, taking a look, understanding what the FedRAMP um, uh, protocols and procedures are, what an ATO is, for example, as well. But again, um, uh, for time purposes, I can't cover everything. I just want to give you some some thoughts. Okay. Now, if you do, for example, to be able to pass this test, you're going to need to know some tools. And I'm not covering all the tools, but I'm going to cover, you know, seven or eight of them. And at least get you thinking. Be able to take the test and identify what tool you should use for what situation. Also, some of the tools like Nmap, for example, understand some of the syntax. I'm not a big fan of memorizing syntaxes, but there'll be a few questions on, um, on being able to do that. So go to Snort. Now, let me just go to my browser here and go over to Snort. Uh, I think I had it up. Now, Snort, this is a, uh, again, probably the most popular tool out there for uh, basically threat detection, getting ahead of the game. If you want to know more about it, go over here, follow the steps. There's a different source code you could download. Uh, the executable is here for Windows. Load this up. You know, again, uh, it's open source. Um, this is just a great tool and actually probably the most basic tool for intrusion protection. So another tool, um, I'm not going to go again probably to every web page, but I did want to go to a few. Uh, Nmap, okay. Now Nmap, pretty much anyone that's been in security has used Nmap. Now, this is basically, uh, again, a, a port scanning tool, uh, a vulnerability scanning tool. So well-known uh, security scanner, go to nmap.org. You can um, find out more if you haven't used it. And again, if you go over to intro, um, this brings you to this page. It tells you what nmap is. Network Mapper. It is open source. Um, you know what it does. Now, when you do take the test, you're going to get questions on uh, syntaxes and, and how to do certain things in, in uh, Nmap. So don't be surprised by that. So my my thought to you is to go and look at up here. Now this looks like an ad actually, but it, this is actually where you want to go um, to um, 
to download uh, reference material but you could also go over here as well so don't get confused then there's also other tools over here as well um, sniffers like you could also look at now we are going to talk about Wireshark and uh, all that but some of the, these other tools I, I recommend you take five minutes and know each of these tools because what's going to happen is when you take the test they're going to ask you identify why you want to use TCP dump or why do you want to use Wireshark be able to do that because if you don't you're gonna you're gonna just bomb out on the test because a lot of the questions are on tool sets and, and how to use them so it's a good part of the test so uh, word to the wise play around with these before you take the test okay Wireshark now Wireshark uh, for those folks that haven't uh, used Wireshark I, I recommend uh, actually I put the, the wrong link in there uh, looked like I put uh, probably yeah I forgot to put a dot there sorry uh, but Wireshark is again very widely used um, there's different uh, solutions to to Wireshark but it's it's mainly used um, for again uh, network uh, protocol and again you go over here depending on the traffic and, and the type of setup you have and, and you know also too do you need 802.11 and areas like that that's up to you but go ahead and you know take a look and, and learn more about Wireshark um, again this is an area uh, you're going to want to know another tool is MRTG this is the uh, grapher tool this is actually a very cool tool. Um, if you haven't used it, my uh, recommendation is to play around with it. Um, you know, again, just like all the other tools, the only way you know them is to to go ahead and um, play around with it. So again, you go ahead and download it here. Um, this is uh, open source. Go ahead and read the doc before you do it, of course. There's going to be certain areas before you install it. My recommendation, I've had much better luck playing on Linux than I've had on Windows. But again, that's that's up to you to, to play around with it. It does the same thing. SolarWinds. Um, now, SolarWinds is, you, you know, again... Uh, a popular tool that you'll see especially around network management uh, IT security um, as, as well as monitoring um, so again um, take a look at Splunk this is a big data uh, you know uh, tool that is very popular as well uh, you know again this is a tool you could use for uh, SIEM purposes Nag uh, Nagios uh, again they they've been around a while they have a great network analyzer and the last tool I want to cover to uh, have you uh, spend some time on is called bro now I love the logo to bro it, it's pretty freaky but uh, again this is a tool that um, you have to know so bro if you go over to the website this is open source they've got the downloads here you can download the source code code over here the keys over here my my recommendation is to play with it as far as I know it only supports Windows documentation is here and before you do anything this is actually very good if you go over to the tutorials they show you how to do this one of the things that we would do uh, in class is walk you through doing this um, bro is definitely something you're going to see uh, a question or two on uh, so do uh, do understand what it is and, and uh, what it can do okay so let's talk about security appliances another area of the task is going to be on security appliances and so one of the areas around security compliance uh, that you'll want to really focus on I think is to understand types of security appliances so for example IDS IPS SIEM whatever firewalls so 
Um, you know, again, antivirus, anti-malware. No matter what the tool sets, whether it's Symantec or if it's from uh, Webroot, um, uh, again, you need to know the right tool for the right situation. So let's talk about configuring a firewall. Now, typically when you deploy a firewall, you're going to typically deploy it at a perimeter in most cases for typically what north and uh, south traffic, not typically for east and west. Now that's different, uh, especially like in micro segmentation or uh, VM or NSX or SDN, let's say. But uh, in general, from a traditional network perspective, it's at a perimeter. But you could also have it at, at a, a segment or a host or an application as well. So for example, Windows has its own built-in firewall. That's a host-based firewall. And uh, rule set. Now, uh, rule sets are important. Now, again, typically, um, firewalls are an implicit deny. So basically, what? Deny, accept. The, the, that's pretty much areas you want to talk about. And then firewalking. Now, the protocols that typically you're going to want to be concerned with when we talk about a firewall, these are going to be the most common ports that you're going to want to accept or deny. Uh, you want to set up rule sets for. Um, for the test, you're going to want to know these. Um, most of you already know these, so this isn't going to be a challenge. But you'll likely get a question or two asking you about um, certain protocols that you may want to block uh, on a firewall, for example. Firewall logs. So firewall logs are a great way to be able to see vulnerabilities, to, to be able to detect what kind of traffic, what kind of um, exploits are being ran against your organization. So typically, um, you may uh, want to um, set up your logging in your firewall to, to really keep track of everything going on. Now, not everyone can do that. Resources could be a challenge for that. Uh, it is disk space, it is memory, it is resources that you're using to be able to keep these logs and analyze these logs. So not only do you keep them, you want tools that are going to be able to analyze those logs. And we'll talk about Splunk, for example, as a possible scenario. Now Splunk is uh, another tool that uh, I, I um, love to spend more time on. But again, there just isn't too much time uh, to do that. Uh, but I, I did want to just take one second to, to go through Splunk. Now, Splunk is, is likely, um, you know, one of the more widely used um, tool sets out there for big data, for collecting um, data, for analyzing uh, logs, for being able to... Um, detect uh, threats, uh, for example, put it, you know, for putting it all together. They have tons of di different products and different solutions. Now, mainly the, the area of focus that you're going to want to focus on um, is going to be mainly around log management and security and fraud. So if you go over to like log management Splunk, Splunk again is a great tool set for this. Um, it gives you all kinds of capabilities, and and again, for time purposes, I won't walk you through um, everything, but do look into that before you take the test. Now, proxies. So, proxy servers are going to be an area that you'll get tested on. Now, there's different types of proxies. Mainly, what I'd like you to know is that there's an outbound proxy and there's an inbound proxy. Now, again, now if you get a test question asking you about what a reverse proxy is, you should know that it's an inbound. Now, of course, they're not going to ask it like that, but I, I just want to make sure you get some of the simple questions. So one of the challenges with taking a test is you can't go into a test expecting to get everything right, at least not normally, not most people. And so you want to pick your battles. So... Memorize the terms that you can memorize. Understand the 
the ones uh, you know that that are easy to remember. I call them the give me questions. Now, on the other hand, um, there's going to be questions that may take more thought. You might have to do some math. Um, again, those are different. You, you may not be able to to go in memorizing a dictionary term. So, um, so you have to know um, where they apply and where they don't. Firewall vendors. Um, now, Cisco uh, has several. Um, solutions out there. PIX uh, is widely used as well as the ASA appliance. Uh, the ASA, for example, is widely used uh, in, the, in the cloud area. Juniper, uh, vendors like IBM HP, and now Checkpoint, Palo Alto Networks. So again, understand why you may want to use Checkpoint versus Palo Alto and what the real differences are. So um, again, do you understand that, uh, excuse me, now as far as the network is concerned, one of the areas that you, you want to spend definitely 20-30 minutes on I would think is to understand um, what an intrusion detection system is. This is essentially typically an appliance or software that you're going to put at different points of your network. Now generally you could put them in line on your network perimeter or put them on a switch port as well. Now typically there's uh, two types. Now Passive is exactly what it sounds like. This is going to be basically, I'm going to sit there and I'm just going to, if something comes along, it's sort of like fishing where you throw that line in the water and you hope the fish comes by and uh, snags it. Active is, is different. It's going to typically run scripts and uh, do different things like uh, turn on and off essentially. This is sort of like fly fishing where you're throwing the line out in the water and you, you're just constantly working. So again, those are generally what you may um, think. Disadvantages. Now, could be slow, could be vulnerable, and again, um, there could be a lot of false, po that well, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to say positively many, <laughs> positively many false positives. Uh, I'm going to spell that right. Um, again, uh, you know, this is an area with the right experience should be fairly straightforward for you. Now, here's a term that a lot of folks may get confused over because one of the problems with the IT industry is that we love to create acronyms. And so what is IDS? What is IPS? And now what is UTM? This is this is basically um, where you're putting everything together to, to essentially, you know, work together. What a thought, huh? And so this is basically where you have a firewall that you're adding essentially capabilities. So traditionally firewalls don't do proxy well. Traditionally firewalls certainly don't want to deal with antivirus or malware. So this is sort of like taking your your um, firewall and throwing web root on it. Um, another area too that uh, I think is interesting is data loss prevention. Now this is more focused around uh, mobile devices in a lot of cases. So for example, what happens when someone's terminated from your job uh, that you're working at, you, you know, um, or the contract you're on, whatever your situation is. Another area around unified threat management I think is really important to, uh, to understand is um, around uh, being able to set up access controls. And uh, I just skipped over that. Let me go back. So again, a lot of this comes down to um, trying to identify anomalies in a lot of cases and being able to control who does what and when. So for example, when you're setting up uh, a UTM 
you know, um, you want to be able to create policies essentially to identify, you know, should someone be logging in to your corporate office in New York from Beijing, China at 2 a.m.? Uh, those are things you may want to do. You know, on the other hand, you know, maybe that's if you have employees in China, that's great. If you don't, then maybe you want to create policies to identify domains and, and countries that uh, should not be logging in. Host-based, uh, you know, uh, host-based IDSs. So, uh, again, you're going to install this on a single host. Um, you're going to typically have um, a client server approach where you're going to have um, an agent sending back, uh, you know, to the mothership basically um, what's going on, send reports and logs. Now, for the test, you want to know the three types of IDSs. So the signature-based, behavior-based, and, and uh, anomaly. Now, signature-based detection, uh, again, this is based um, on specific uh, sequences and updates. And so one of the challenges around that is um, signatures constantly change, you know, time change, uh, the, the resource changes. So, again, it could be um, a challenge to keep up with uh, certificates and signatures. Behavior-based, this is, again, um, uh, identifying policies that should be able to identify, <clears throat> excuse me, my throat uh, is, isn't 100% uh, yet, but uh, this is where typically we would uh, uh, want to create a policy around trying to um, identify behaviors in an organization and so if we know that sales folks will log in at a certain time and download certain reports then that's okay but then if we see folks uh, you know logging in at 2 a.m. and downloading backup files then we know that that you know is a behavior that we probably want to deal with Snort. Now, Snort is, again, widely used uh, IPS, IDS, uh, I mean. Source, Fire, Bro, we talked about uh, Bro briefly. And then you could also script by using regular expressions like, if this happens, do this. Now, one of the areas of focus um, for a lot of the CompTIA certs, especially like Security Plus and ASP and Network Plus, is that the U.S. government, um, specifically the DOD, re uh, requires that anyone with basically privileged access is required to get um, a security cert or a, a server-based cert like Server Plus or Linux. And a lot of this just depends on the, your role, and I'll talk briefly about that. For those folks trying to understand what DOD uh, 8570, 8140 is, you go ahead and uh, I'll put actually uh, I'll put the link on the, the YouTube page uh, here for you. So more information about 8570. You could see here there's what's called um, access um, levels here. And depending on your role, so for example, if you provision email accounts, you'll likely be more focused um, around a level one. But if you're like the root administrator on a, uh, you know, enterprise data storage array or server, you'll likely need to be a level three, depending on your role. So can you... Uh, install configure the system can you back up files delete files so a lot of the, the roles um, are going to be tied to what's called an IAT level this is basically what's called a privilege level okay um, just about done I, I wanted to get you all done with uh, within an hour 
and um, what I did was I, I basically um, put in six questions that I think are good just to, for you all to gauge how how knowledgeable you really are as a CSA. And I put the answers there. Again, um, the goal is not to scare you away, but to get you thinking, to, to make sure you start studying for the right stuff. Now, what are the six rules of engagement for penetration testing? So timing, the scope. So before you do anything, you want to identify the scope, right? Authorization, exploitation, communication, and reporting. What are the classes of security controls that are identified by the syllabus? So again, if you took the course, the, the, the three areas we would be talking about would be physical. Now, physical is exactly what it means. That's where you're going to put up barriers that people can, can't get past. It could be anything from biometrics to gates to man traps to security guards. Logical. This is again going to be typically virtualization in a lot of cases. This is going to be um, ACLs, etc. And then administrative as well. Now there's a term here um, called firewalking. Now this is basically a way that you would basically check out what roles are essentially configured on a firewall. Number four. What are two principal factors uh, involved in calculating risk? So basically, the two factors would be likelihood and impact. So likelihood meaning, you know, what are the chances this could happen? So, you know, uh, for example, let's think of it this way. Um, you know, what are the chances that the power grid goes down in New York this summer? Who knows? You know, no one really knows. But then, you know, what about if you're located uh, in, you know, central Texas or northern Texas? What's the chance of a tornado going through your town? It's probably pretty high, right, if you're in Tornado Alley. So it all depends, you know. The impact, this is basically what will happen if, uh, if something did occur. So basically, you know, what will be the financial impact? What would be the... Um, you know, the, the impact to the company. What type of policy you, might you include or supplement with a bring your own device? Now, part of the test is going to be around mobile. Again, you want to spend some time on mobile. Um, again, um, I, I encourage you to understand bring your own device, um, you know, understand mobility. Uh, and, and try to understand areas around security around that area. Um, also, too, like loss prevention, um, etc. But this this would be specified in what's called an AUP. That's an acceptable use policy. Again, if you've taken CASP or you've taken CISSP, this is nothing new to you. Number six, um, this is where you're going to want to read the cybersecurity framework. Again, when I was, was going over the frameworks from NIST, no joke, you're going to see numerous questions on this. Um, and, and, and again, this could be the difference for you passing or not passing. Um, so I, I encourage you to get to know NIST. Go ahead and match up um, the, uh, the JTA and areas of study that you want to do. Um, around uh, the, the frameworks. So I'm going to wish everybody luck that takes the test. Um, definitely feel free to contact me on YouTube or LinkedIn or via my website as well. Now, I, I wish everybody luck. I really um, enjoyed y'all viewing uh, and, and participating as well. Feel free to leave some comments. Um, I'm going to also um, be posting several more videos here in the next three to five days I've been working on. Um, I'm going to do another one on CSA as well as Cloud Plus and, and Google Cloud Platform as well. So happy testing, happy, um, uh, you know, 
profitable year ahead. Thanks again for joining, and do reach out. Let me know how you do on the test.